Okay, I think it's going. All right. Uh, so I'm going to uh, first of all, a little, just a little housekeeping. I think probably most everybody who's participating uh, has done this before, uh, been with us before, but. Um, Professor Youngblood is going to, uh, will be stopping periodically during his presentation to take questions. Uh, and so if at that point you have a question, the easiest way to do it is use the space bar on your computer to unmute yourself, ask your question, and then release the spa space bar and you'll be back on mute. Uh, and now I'll turn this over to my wife, Kathy McKee, who's the curriculum chairman. Chairperson. Or chair, right? right yes, right. <laughs> Gender we, neutral. We we at Clear are really excited to welcome back Jordan Youngblood. Um, Jordan is a professor of uh, associate professor of English at Eastern, where we get many of our really good speakers. He's also co-director of the New Media Studies, and we're all especially <laughs> interested in the difference between lies and truth. And Jordan is going to cover. Um, deep face, fakes, Facebook updates, and 5G conspiracy theories, which have all been in the news and we're all aware of. So, Jordan, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, again, so my name is Jordan Youngblood. Um, I've, as, as Kathy noted, I'm, I'm an associate professor of English and New Media Studies at Eastern. Um, today's content is taken from a, a junior and senior level class that I teach called Digital Rhetoric. Um, and the purpose of that class, it's a fusion of an English class and a, and a new media class, which is to say, how do we persuade, engage, and communicate with one another in a digital world? Um, so this is to ask upper level English students and from other disciplines um, to think critically about the ways in which they engage with one another um, as, as they work through an <laughs> online environment. Um, and a large part of that is understanding self-presentation and also meaning making. So today, uh, the title is, um, it's a Seinfeld reference. Uh, this is from an episode in which Jerry is asked to take a polygraph test and he's worried about it. So he goes to the one uh, trained liar that he knows, which is George, <laughs> his friend. And George walks him through, George initially says, I, I, I can't teach you to do this. It's like if you ask Pavarotti how to teach you to sing, you, you, a, a liar is born. And so Jerry walks through, he's like, you got to give me some advice. And as, as Jerry gets up to leave, George turns to him and he says, Jerry, I have one piece of advice for you. It's not a lie if you believe it. And so this, this understanding dawns on Jerry's face and he walks out of the restaurant. But this idea of what is it that makes a thing true? Is it my need for it to be true? Is it the ability for me to claim that a thing is true in order to let you know that I believe the same way as you do? Is it the quote unquote objective nature of its truth? And how is that changing and adapting in a digital landscape? Um, so that's really kind of the core of what today's talk is going to be about and some of my interests as a, as a scholar more broadly. Um, so I have an opening exercise, which is, this is what we call trust maps. Um, so let me sort of begin with, so I'd like you for a moment to think about the various places you receive information on a regular basis. We're constantly inundated with new bits of knowledge from the personal to the global to everything in between. How do we know what to filter out? What goes into our process of determining how and what we believe? So the first thing that I would ask you to think about, and I'm going to ask everybody kind of at the end of this slide, if you feel compelled to share um, where you would trace this arc, um, who do you believe? So that could be anything from a close friend or colleague that could be, well, if my brother says it's true, I believe it or I tend to believe my children, or I tend to believe perhaps uh, it could be a pastor, it could be uh, a teacher, it could be any number of things. Um, but that could also extend out to celebrity figures. Well, I trust this journalist, or I trust this writer, or I trust this political figure, although obviously that tends to be the most contentious of questions of, of individuals to believe. But I, starting first at the level of who, who do you believe? And thinking there. Then you would extend out to what do you believe and in what things? So 
is it not just particular individuals, but particular entities? Well, I believe it if the church says it, right? If I am a faithful person and an authority from an organization in which I place faith says that something is true, I am inclined to believe it because that's part of who I am. Or I believe this organization, which I'm affiliated with, if my workplace says that something is true, I'm inclined to believe that. Or if I'm part of a volunteer organization, or if I'm part of a political or philosophical or personal organization, I'm willing to listen to that. And then there are the things that you hold no faith in whatsoever. Those are the things that you are like, nothing could compel me. To believe that this is true, right? So for some, this could be a question of ideological or religious faith, right? No one determines this for me, but me. Um, this could be a question of anything from my faith to my, uh, even my relationships with others, right? No one can tell me whether or not this is a, a true thing or not. Um, the most dangerous, and this is what we're going to get into a little bit, comes down to things like science, right? No one can tell me whether or not that is true. I will determine it for myself, right? You can't tell me that the earth is round. I will be the one to figure that out for myself. Or you will not be the one to tell me that this is how a disease works. I will figure that out for myself. So if I was to ask you to kind of think through this process in terms of who or what you believe and what you will never believe, where would you say that you stand? Mm. And this is, this is open to, to everybody. There's certainly no order of operations here, but if you were to think about, do you place your faith in individuals? Do you place your faith in organizations? Or are you sort of like, I don't put my faith in anything. I am the one person who ascertains what is true or false and the rest, the rest can eat it. <laughs> I would say, um, for, for one thing, I tend to put my trust, I'll say organizations, but like there are particular journalistic entities that okay. have a history of being, uh, you know, presenting the facts and being reasoned and so on and so forth. So I tend to trust things that come from those sources and in, in particular, um, the journalists that are associated with those uh, particular sources. So you would say, so say, for example, if we were to grab it, like say NPR, right? The idea of NPR being an, it is, it is federally funded to some extent. So, or, or the BBC in England, right? The idea of, oh, okay, these are entities that are funded by some, although certainly in those instances, there would still be the idea of, well, if it's funded by the government, to what extent do they push and pull on what is offered or what is not, or what sort of financial requirements that they have. But then within that, you're like, well, I don't just listen to everybody on NPR the same way. I'm really into Terry Gross if she says something, or if it's the New York Times, right? I'm willing to read the Times, but there are these journalists, like I'm more inclined to listen to this individual compared to this individual. So Richard, you say it's kind of a mingling of both organization and individual trust? Uh, yeah, I w that's what I would say. Uh, hey, this is Charlie speaking, Jordan. Hi, Charlie. And uh, uh, I agree with Richard. It, it, it's an integrated level. It's not one specific thing. It's it's an amalgam of all the different <laughs> variances. But one that's very important to me is my own personal experiences and how I bounce that information off of what I've learned in my life. Um, sure. And uh, when it comes to the uh, concrete facts, such as science, um, I'm not open to being swayed uh, based mm -hmm. on what I've learned in my life from science. But when it comes to the more cultural aspects of life, uh, and the culture wars which are going on in our country right now, that maps more into, again, um, how I feel, how, as Richard said, how I perceive the source. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do cross-checking of sources so that it's not just one information source, but okay. rather opposing sources, which can put up contradictory views, and then I can sort of reach a conclusion. So that, I mean, you're a good Hegelian in that nature, right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, right? Take take opposing views, combine them together, see what leads to perhaps a more nuanced overall understanding of the issue, and then that's filtered through your experiences as a person. And you kind of say, all right, based on that, 
I mean, that would be, you know, you, you are, you are working on an epistemological level of experience, right? I, I have seen this, I have witnessed it, therefore X, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Yeah. On, yeah. On, on an individual level, as well as an organizational level, I tend to, tr to trust scientists like Dr. Fauci, the right. CDC, um, I consider those reliable sources of information as opposed to Fox News, for example. One of the things that gets really interesting when we come to the question of science, right, is to what extent or to what bodies of people has science been most reliable to? And this is not to throw more, has, did anybody see about the lawsuit that the NFL is having to settle in terms of black athletes and concussions? Oh. The NFL has settled for about a billion and a half do dollars to athletes of color because the science that the NFL was using to base concussion levels on was based on a study which placed black athletes at a lower level of intellectual functioning. Yeah. So the idea was this was the baseline of what neurological activity was like for a black player. So yeah. therefore, compared to white players, this is what we consider to be an acceptable level of, of a concussion. Now that was based on the NFL's own scientific research. They were like, well, we're basing it off of these facts that are brought to us. And since we believe black players to operate at this level of neurological activity, the, the idea was called race norming. And this is, and they just had to settle this week for about a billion and a half dollars to prior players who were like, wait a minute, I know I've suffered concussions. I know I was placed in unhealthy settings. Um, so this feeling of, we go, yes, the science, right? And then you go, okay, well, who was the science made for? What was the purpose behind it? Who was the, what was the organization that ordered the test? And so you get into that layer of trust, right? Okay, do I trust all science? Do I trust the science that's based in an organization like the CDC, which is meant to be an objective entity that is good for the good of all Americans compared to a scientific study created by the NFL to back up X, Y, or Z. This is all to get us started on what is inevitably an incredibly complex question, which is how does one decide what to believe and what challenges it? And so when we start looking a little bit at this idea of communal truth, there is a chart at the end. Julie Beck is a staff writer for The Atlantic, and she wrote an article in 2017 aptly called This Article Won't Change Your Mind. Um, and in it, you know, you, it's, it's, and it's an article about trust and belief. So there was a poll in 2014 that said that 30% of Americans felt that most people could be trusted. This was down from 48% in 1985. So this idea of in the span of 20 years, we have almost a 20% drop in the idea of most people can be believed, right? We're now down to, and you know, that was in 2014. It'd be fascinating to offer the poll again in 2021 and see where <laughs> we're at. Um, but this idea of what Beck gets into is she has this idea, she calls it particularized trust. Um, it's the trust that you have for people, right? So when we decide to support certain stories or information, we oftentimes may not necessarily be declaring our faith in the information, but the individuals who brought it to us. Well, I know that so-and-so wouldn't lie to me, right? Or I know that so-and-so wouldn't deceive me, or I know that so-and-so is a verifiable source, so I'm going to put my trust in them. And of course, this gets really tricky. I mean, there's already been a number of allusions today to our political situation. If you put your faith in a specific individual, right? President Trump wouldn't lie to me, or to be even-handed, President Biden wouldn't lie to me, right? If they say it, I mean, and this is often the power of an ideologue, right? The idea of if the person in charge says that it's true, well, why would they deceive me, right? In fact, it is comforting. It is deeply satisfying to believe that there is an individual or individuals in which I can put absolute trust and faith, right? That's oftentimes what, that is kind of essentially the core of religion, right? Well, I, there are so many things that I don't know, but I know that there is a higher power being which operates things along rules and ideas that I can trust in or have faith in. When you extend that kind of, oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just just as a follow up to that, uh, again, the, you're, you're articulating that it could be the person that you believe in. But back to what I said <laughs> at the very beginning, where's the critical thinking coming in sure. when somebody who you think is 
in a in a, a place of authority tells you to uh, inject bleach into your arm. I mean, isn't there some kind of critical thinking that goes, well, I might have believed this guy, but this is crazy. What's really interesting is that some of the best research that's been done on that is actually combining it with the mentality that goes into an abusive relationship. It is actually safer for me. It's a traumatic response. If I cease to believe in everything that you are telling me, that actually ruptures my whole worldview, right? If I can't continue to believe in you wholeheartedly, then the whole skeleton around which I have constructed myself starts to collapse. And so I, I, it is safer for me, or at least it feels safer for me to continue to believe, even if you're telling me inject bleach into my arm, I'm going to do it because in a weird way, that's less terrifying than me having to make the decision for myself or actually go, wait, you're doing me harm. Actually, this person that, and it's also a sunk cost mentality. I've given 20, 30 years of my life to this belief or this person or this identity, um, or this is a need that I have right now. And if I can't trust in you, there is what I think I would, what I would say there is there's this fascinating question of critical thinking often requires risk, right? The idea of I could be wrong. And that is a danger. That is a very real, I mean, if I certainly not to open this up, but if anyone in here has gone through a process of falling out of religious faith, right? That can be a traumatic, even horrific experience because, I mean, certainly I have students up here who, you know, talk about the fallout that their family still has from the allegations in the Catholic Church, right? This is how we made community. This is how we made an understanding of one another. I needed to believe in this. And all of a sudden you're telling me these things that threaten my sense of self and my sense of community. Can I allow for that to be true? And so what I think is the interesting question is not whether or not we are training people to be critical thinkers. The horrific thing is when we train people to be critical thinkers and they turn it off knowingly being like, I know that that sounds wrong, but if it's wrong, things are bad for me. And I think that's really what you see right now with a lot of our political figures. You have people saying, how can you be saying this? How can you be saying that this is true when it's clearly not? And they're looking at it and they're going, it's better for me if it is, you know, <laughs> it's better. And that's uh, this idea of, I, I'll sort of hop over to this next one. We lie a lot. That's, that's just the honest truth. People do this. In fact, the activity that I have here, how many of you told an extended lie to your children at some point in their childhood? What did you tell them? And, and I'm actually going to make an exception here. It can't be the Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. It has to be some other <laughs> lie that you told your children in order to get them to do something or behave a particular way or act in a certain way. One of my students said um, they were told that you couldn't turn a light on in a car at night or you'd get pulled over. Like that was the lie that their parents told them to get them to stop fiddling with the, with the lights in the car. They were like, if you do that, we will get arrested and we'll go to jail. And the kid was like, I will never touch a light in a car ever again, even after I've been told that's not true. Um, for them, that was, and the parent clearly was like, it's useful for me if my kid stops fiddling with the light. So guess what? You'd go to jail if you touch the light. So that was a lie that was useful for them. Does anyone else in here have a lie that you told your kids in order to get a result that you wanted? You don't answer, please. Somebody in China will die of hunger. <laughs> there you go. There you go. The, the, the food fallacy, right? If you, you know, or, you know, the idea of I've, I had one student say that their parents turned it into guilt. They were like, do you want protective services to come here and allege that I like, if you go to school looking like a skeleton, what are they going to think of me? Right? This idea of like, you better eat your food or people are going to think poorly of me. But this idea of we oftentimes we deploy useful lies because we think it is a means of leading to a better truth, right? Okay, yes, the police aren't going to come and get you if you don't eat your peas, but if you eat your peas, you will be healthier and eventually we can take the lie away and go, okay, yeah, the police were never coming, but isn't it better that you have a whole, like a well-rounded diet and you like vegetables? And now at the end of the day, you see that that was for your own good. The trick is what happens when you never reveal that the lie was false, right? What if you just continue with the narrative that that thing continues to be true? 
And that's where we actually weirdly find ourselves in a lot of ways, politically or otherwise. You have people admitting, well, I know that that thing's not true, but I need people to be worried about an issue that I care about. So really, this is a useful lie. Like, I know that immigrants aren't bashing over the border right now to kill us all, but if I don't say it like that, people aren't going to be concerned about immigration. So ultimately, yeah, I exaggerated the topic a little bit in order to get to people to care about a thing that they should care about. And that's the danger is of useful lies, right? Um, we're about to get to a, a term that Sean Spicer came up, which was the idea of, uh, of nebulous facts, right? Okay. Well, that fact is true for you, but this is my fact, right? And so that feeling of even when what we would assume to be the bedrock of objective truth in itself becomes a manipulatable thing, this obviously gets into a really tricky question of the moment that you start pulling away anything that makes you distrust an authority figure, the like what we're seeing around, do, do people sort of see the conversations happening about the idea of critical race theory being taught in schools? This has been a big thing over really the last two or three months. The idea being that if we teach our children in school that America comes from, the big thing is the 1619 Project, which I'm sure some of you may have potentially heard about, the New York Times, sort of a, a new way of teaching American history that's built around slavery being a bedrock that sort of builds sort of the structure of America rather than sort of the founding, the pilgrims, all of that, that it's built in a, a, a narrative built around racial injustice. The belief there being that if we teach our children that way to distrust their country, or to think that their country is bad or that there is a level of inherited guilt based on these things, this will lead to a variety of ripples that will do negative things, right? If one is not patriotic, then what will it get them to think about X, Y, or Z, or the idea that that narrative isn't true to begin with, right? What, what happens next? So this feeling of if the, the trick there is that part of it comes from this question of authority. If my school is teaching me to believe a particular way, and ultimately I find out that the school left something out, this is one of the biggest issues with communities of color and medicine, right? You ask, you, if you ask a black individual, why do you trust, why do you tend to distrust vaccines? All they have to bring up is Tuskegee, right? For years, these men were injected with what they were told was a vaccine, but they were actually being injected with syphilis to test its long-term effects on individuals unknowingly. And so that community looks at it and says, these people put their faith in an institution that was meant to protect them and it didn't. Why are you asking me to put faith back in it now? And so that feeling of when and how, if you remove that domino of trust, right? If I can't trust schools, if I can't trust the news media, if I can't trust politicians, if I can't trust, well, then who is left to trust? And that's been really, um, Rush Limbaugh articulated it about as effectively as one could in 2010. He was like, these are the four pillars of deceit in American society, science, journalism, academia, and media. So those are the four that you shouldn't trust because they are dominated by, a, by the left that wants to tell you what to think. Now, if you think about the role of those four things in what you believe, let's say that you take out journalism. Do not trust the newspapers. They are lying to you. Do not trust your teachers. They are lying to you. Do not trust science. It is lying to you. Do not trust the media more broadly. It is lying to you. What is left? And that, that's an open question. I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated. Like what at that point is left to believe in? Well, clearly he's saying that, you know, Rush Limbaugh is, le is left. I mean, that's right. the people who promote that kind of thing are saying, you know, these are all the, these are the kind of people that have um, talk shows. And, and, and I think really what they're trying to do is, is basically build a cult following in a sense. And so they're telling you, don't trust anybody else. Trust me. I'm, I'm the only one you right. can trust. I'm not, I'm not biased. I mean, and, and that's really, I mean, not to make Fox News the whipping boy here, but the, the tagline of the organization is fair and balanced, right? This idea of bias infects everyone but us, right? The <laughs> idea of this is, this is a phenomenon that happens to others, but we're not going to fall into it. 
And so that idea of, and you see this right now, so my institution, Eastern, we're actually seeing a dip in enrollment, and Bill Salka can actually speak to this when he comes and talks to you guys. It's because we're dubbed as a liberal arts institution. And we have parents coming to us and saying, so wait a minute, are you going to make my children liberals? <laughs> and we're having to explain like, well, okay, the, the term liberal arts is not a political ideology. It's a manner of thinking, right? It's a matter of critical thinking. We're not here to indoctrinate your children, but what they see is the term liberal arts. We've actually lost students due to their parents being like, I'm not sending my kid off to one of those liberal making schools. And so that feeling of, I don't trust you, right? There is an inherent distrust of, you can call it wokeness, you can call it cancel culture, you can call it whatever you want, but this feeling of what you are doing is a manipulation of the world that I know to be true. And it's the intensity of that belief, right? I am going to send my kid, what you are seeing right now is a lot of public institutions are seeing an enrollment drop, but where is actually seeing a spike right now? are religious institutions. Religious institutions are actually seeing a rise in student enrollment because their parents are like, we're gonna send you to a place where you will have your views agreed with, right? Mm -hmm. This is a place that will be safe for you, right? You can believe what you believe and you're not gonna have a godless liberal professor telling you that, you know, go read Nietzsche and burn all of your holy books and et cetera, et cetera, right? But that <laughs> feeling of, I am, there is a feeling of we are associating more and more with what we already believe. You don't send your kid, like, there's no longer this feeling of I send my child off to college to figure themselves out. It's I send my kid off to college to already affirm who they are, right? My child is religious. I am sending them to a religious college to become more religious. And on the flip side of that, my child is already progressive. I am sending them to a progressive college to become more progressive. So this feeling of how my sense of self dictates not just my own beliefs, but the beliefs that I will continue to engage with. Um, right. This is, I realize this may be sort of common knowledge. How many of you know that Google adapts your search results based on where you are? Mm -hmm. So if you do a search for guns in Texas, you will get a drastically different set of results than if you were to take, do the same Google search while standing in Connecticut. And what that will do is it will base itself based on what people in the surrounding area have clicked on. So it's gonna go, oh, you're searching for guns in Texas? Well, you must want this, right? And it's going to combine that with your already existing search history. So it's like, well, you tend to click on articles that look like this and you're looking for guns, so you probably want to see this. So this idea of turning to Google, it's one of the things that I have to tell my students a lot of, they're like, oh, well, if I want to know the truth about something, I'll Google it. And it's actually like, no, Google's going to tell you what it thinks you want to already know, right? Because of where you are, what you've already looked at, the advertiser information that's embedded into your account, they're going to be like, yeah, sure, we'll tell you everything that there is to know about tortoises. Um, we also noticed that you're really into pets. Would you like to buy one? And you're like, that's not the first thing that I want to see about tortoises is where to go buy a tortoise. And Google's like, well, we think you could use it. So that feeling of, okay, I'm going to turn to these, you know, this idea of all of this information is out there waiting for you. It is, but it's being presented to you in a light that already assumes who you are. I'm guessing many of you can probably speak to a moment where you've been like, wait a minute, I just looked for shoes the other day. Why are all of my advertisements nothing but shoes now, right? And and suddenly Google's like, well, because you're a shoe type of person, aren't you? That comes with knowledge as well. Oh, you seem like a um, one of the most interesting things Facebook had to disclose this four years ago. Facebook would create silently a political identity for you. It would look at what you clicked on and who your friends were. And in the background, it would create a political identity for you that was hidden. And that was on eight scales, very conservative, conservative, moderate, um, liberal, very liberal, apathetic. And so it would then generate content for you that would just seem like, oh, that's just my newsfeed. It was like, oh, you're a very liberal person. I'm sure you'd love to hear about this. Now, of course, that gets into a really tricky thing of like, okay, your algorithm has decided who I am politically. 
Um, but it also caused very real problems in that what other organizations realized, for example, there was a lawsuit that was brought in New York that a company said explicitly do not show our real estate ads to anybody who has listed their income rating as less than $80,000. We would like those people to not even know we exist. Same thing for people of color. Do not show our apartments if their profile lists that they are a person of color. That's not the clientele that we want. So this idea of, oh, this, uh, this information is free and available to me, there's all this stuff happening behind the scenes that we think of that, you know, this idea of critical thinking, it's not even just the content that you're getting, you're having to critically think, why did I get this content? Why is it being shown to me? What isn't being shown to me? And that's where we get into this idea. Of, I think it's really insidious when sort of people say like, oh, the reason that you got tricked is because you're stupid. Right? Nobody would believe that unless they're dumb or nobody would believe that uh, like, and I can't be deceived because I'm a smart person. There, Chris Hayes and David Roberts did a podcast on this idea of the, what they call the epistemological crisis in America. And there's a quote from Roberts that I really like. And he says, the problem is, is that we think of facts now, like lawyers, we go and get facts to defend the argument that we've already made for ourselves rather than letting the facts dictate the argument to come. So basically, if I come into a courtroom and I need to show that you're not guilty, I'm only going to accumulate the facts that prove that you're not guilty, rather than being like, well, I will let the case dictate whether you're guilty or not guilty. So that twist of, do we think of things like researchers or do we think of things like lawyers, which is, I need this to be true to prove my case, that's a very different relationship to facts and truth. Um, and when facts are a way to win an argument, like I need this to be true in order to be right, that leads you to a very dangerous place. So um, do, I, I'm hoping that this is visible. Does anybody recognize this picture that's available here on the screen? I, I, I realize that everyone's on different size screens and this is not as easy as it would be in person. Uh, but does anybody happen to recognize this picture? Las Vegas shooting. That's an interesting, so that's an interesting guess. Um, other folks in terms of what you think that might be. That's actually a picture from the, Hong, that's Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah. Yep. That's Hong Kong from 2019. The trick is, is that this picture was then used in a variety of news stories as depicting Ferguson retroactively and also used to depict the George Floyd protests in 2020 because these individuals are wearing masks. Now, it doesn't matter that there's a large glowing skyscraper in the background that actually shows where this would be. There's Chinese characters on that sign. And if you take a moment to look at the ethnicity of the individuals involved, you could probably tell, hey, those look like people from Hong Kong. But the trick is, is that this is a really compelling image to show people being apparently violent, right? There's a Molotov cocktail lit. There's people in gas masks. The trick is that this picture spread on multiple news stories that had absolutely nothing to do with its place of origin because it looks scary. And that is admittedly the thing about contextless information, right? If I need this thing to be true, then I will share it because it echoes my beliefs of what I assume those protests to have actually been like, right? This Hong Kong can become Minneapolis, can become New York, can become any city if I need it to be true. Now, I mentioned in my email that I would talk about deep fakes. The thing is, is that we're not even running into problems with deep fakes yet. We're running into problems with people just saying, do you see this picture? That's Minneapolis. And people go, yeah, it would be really helpful if that was Minneapolis because it shows that people there are being bad. We're not even needing sophisticated digital trickery to get people to believe things that are lies. All we need is just somebody to say, yeah, well, that fits. That sounds like bad people would light things and throw them at that location. So that turns out to be true. The worst example of this, this is from an article, uh, an author named Lisa Fazio. 
there was a psychological study that showed that if people, you could claim that turtles are deaf, which is insane. There's absolutely no scientific evidence that says that turtles are deaf. But if you put a picture of a turtle in that article, people were more likely to believe that turtles were deaf. They're like, well, there's a picture of a turtle right there. And if you're telling me that it's deaf, I mean, I'm looking at it. Yeah, I guess I could see that turtles are deaf. That's where we're at. We're not even talking about manipulation of, of, of data on a wide scale basis. We're just talking about showing somebody a picture and saying, are you willing to believe a crazy thing? And they're like, well, there is a picture of it right there. Yeah, turtles are deaf. Yeah, that's Minneapolis. Yeah, that's wherever I need that to be because I need it to be true. Um, and this leads to this idea of sticky and spreadable content. This is a theorist named Henry Jenkins. He has a great book called Convergence Culture. If anybody is interested in some summer reading, uh, it's, it's a fun read. And his argument is that we used to think of content as sticky, right? It came from a clear place with a clear origin, with a clear person who made it, and it was built for a particular reason. What we have moved into is spreadable content, which is that the place of origin, um, I don't know how many of you here invest in the wide uh, internet world of memes. Um, memes are the ultimate example of spreadable content. Nobody claims credit for a meme. No one goes, oh yeah, I, I did the cheeseburger cat, right? Or, oh, I'm the person who created the dancing baby. It just happens and it spreads and it moves and it flows between individuals and all of a sudden it's at your doorstep and you accept it. And this is the problem with news stories, with images, with anecdotal stories. Spreadable content works because it does not need to have a verifiable origin. It just is. And that's the danger of if this goes from a picture that's about a specific moment at a specific time at a specific place to here's a picture of people being violent, use it as you see fit. And that's really where we're kind of at on a data level in terms of content. This slide won't change your mind. It won't. That's actually true. If most people, when any of the arguments that I have put forth today, it's very likely that it would do nothing. And in fact, that's kind of where we're at right now, which is to what extent is this is the real problem that we're running into with academia, which is to what extent is all content preaching to the choir? Who is still reachable? Who is still engaging with content in a critical way? Um, and that's due to a concept that's called motivated reasoning. Um, so this is back to Julie Beck. This is quote, how people convince themselves or remain convinced of what they want to believe. They seek out agreeable information and learn it more easily, and they avoid, ignore, devalue, forget, or argue against information that contradicts their beliefs. Um, if I was to open this up to a question, how many of you could identify at least one person in your social media life that operates from a space of motivated reasoning? They have one viewpoint, one purpose, one goal, and that is what they share consistently and predominantly. Do you have anybody like that? Or do you actually find that you have a pretty even handed group of folks? No, I definitely have, I definitely have people that are that post political stuff. Um, and it's, you know, always clearly stuff that promotes their particular belief. And to a certain extent, we would, we would say, well, okay, there's a level of consistency to that, right? So I, I, if I deeply believe a particular way, it would be kind of odd for me to start sharing information that was contradictory to it. Or um, the real trick of this now is that, is it that the idea is contradictory? Is it that one is true and one is false, right? The idea of, if I am sharing information about the CDC, do I, in order to appear even handed, do I go, well, okay, so this is the content that I'm hearing for Dr. Fauci, but in order to have an open mind, let me also share this, this idea that um, you should go and bathe yourself in sunlight 23 hours a day and your natural immune system will take over and win the day. Now, most people would say, no, you don't share the other content because that just sounds crazy. But that feeling of where is the middle of this, right? Do I share things that fit with my worldview and also share things that do not because I want to provide an even-handed understanding of the world 
But what are the lines at which I'm like, no, there is no opposing side to me. Like if I share the opposite of what I believe, that's actually a danger. I'm not going to share you the opposite of not getting vaccinated because I think that's bad. Or I'm not going to share you the opposite of January 6th was done by a bunch of Antifa crazy, like that feeling of if I show you the other side, what is the other side? What does that mean? How do I fit in this spectrum? And this is where we get into the question of tribal epistemology. Tribal epistemology is a fancy way of saying, do I share something because I believe it to be true or do I share something because it helps other people identify who I am and who I belong with? So this is the idea of, um, this is a portmanteau that I like a lot. Um, has anyone here heard of the idea of slacktivism? Slacktivism is the idea of, you know what? I'm really gonna show how much it means to me that LGBTQ people have equality. I'm changing my profile picture to a rainbow flag. That'll do it. I have, I have changed the world. That's my political action. This is, slacktivism is the idea that you do a thing not necessarily to actually aid the thing that you believe that you are aiding, but it's to let other people know that you think it's important to aid it and that you are a person who believes that way. So I am going to simply share an image of, hey, it's, uh, so I, I work with the Pride, so my research, I deal a lot with LGBTQ kids and, and work and research. So it's Pride Month. This is on my mind. Um, the idea of if I post, hey, happy Pride Month, is that meant to actually help kids or is it to show other people that I am cool with kids who identify as LGBTQ? Now, that's a tricky question, right? To what extent is this to actually help them feel welcome or is it actually to signal to other people, hey, by the way, I'm a cool progressive person who believes totally cool, interesting things. On the flip side of that, is there an idea or a way at which um, sharing content or sharing information becomes a way of actually amplifying the core issue while not turning it into an exemplar of one's own gifts or skills or knowledge? And that's where you get into kind of an ongoing question of, I'm guessing some of you probably have at least one individual on your feed that it's like, get over yourself. Like, how often are you going to show just how open-minded you are? At a certain point, this isn't about you being open-minded. This is about the causes that you are advocating for, not about your ability to claim that you are open-minded. And on the opposite side of that, right? It could be the ongoing declaration of a particular kind of belief. This is the problem that we're in right now is that it has never been easier to find somebody who believes what you believe, no matter what it is. Um, there used to be this idea of, uh, I'm sure people in here have heard about QAnon or are aware of what QAnon is or how it operates. The trick with QAnon is that if this was a localized phenomenon, right? If you did not have something like the internet, you'd have one person in a community of a hundred believing that, um, yes, there were actually pedophiles in that pizza restaurant in New Jersey that Hillary Clinton was playing for, paying for with Satan blood. And they had to go, right, there would be like one person who believed that, but there would be no nexus for them to connect. The trick is, is that if you take that one in 100 that's localized, that would die off, and you turn that into an intercontinental grid, the one in 100 suddenly does not see itself as one in 100. It sees all of these other pe people who finally believe like I do, right? And that's often, it's an incredibly compelling narrative, right? It's not that I'm crazy. It's that everybody else isn't willing to believe the truth, right? And that's, it's an incredibly hypnotic tool, right? Is actually, you don't get it. The elites, the people who control the world, right? If you look at some of the recent polling, that suggests that among certain political circles, one in four now believe that there is a deep state um, cabal of Satanists who are sacrificing children in order to gain long lasting life. One in four, right? Because the more and more that an idea crops up, it stops being that one crazy in your community and then it goes, well, actually, I have been seeing more and more that there's this idea that Democrats drink people's blood. 
I mean, if a bunch of people are saying it, I mean, I don't know. And then the people who believe it really, really believe it and just keep posting about it. And it's like, well, I did see the other day that there was a person somewhere in some location that was caught doing a weird thing. Maybe it's not so crazy after all that somebody could have a child porn basement in a pizza restaurant. And before you know it, there is this arc of that's crazy to, well, I'm hearing a lot about it to actually the people who are believing this are coming up with a lot of other really interesting stuff too, to actually, I think I might believe it. And that is where this really, really, you know, David, you were asking earlier about this isn't new. No, there've been cults forever. Um, one of the first formative memories that I have as a kid growing up in Texas was David Koresh um, and Waco. Um, if anybody in here remembers the Branch Davidians in the 1990s, um, the cult that basically burned itself down, um, that it, there was, I think it was 45 people who died in a compound in Waco. It is not new to convince people. I mean, Jim Jones in Jamestown. I mean, these are not new phenomenon of getting people to believe things that might be harmful or dangerous to them. The trick is now it has never been easier to say, you know what? It's not just a couple of us. There are more of us out there than you might think. And then there is. And that is the spread. That's this idea here. The bolded quote that I have on here. If you encounter 10 people who seem to have roughly the same idea, then it fools your system into thinking that it must be a probable idea because lots of people agree with it. One thing you assume unconsciously is that these 10 people came to the same belief independently. You don't think that nine of these 10 are just repeating what the 10th one said. So this idea of one person comes along and says, you know, somebody's out there drinking blood and then nine other people decide, hey, I heard that there's somebody out there drinking blood and they don't even have a source for it anymore outside of that original person, but then all 10 believe it. And then you come across those 10 and you go, well, maybe I should be the 11th person that believes this because lots of people are saying that's where we're at. Now, um, this leads to uh, being a good rhetorician, the idea of ethos. Um, ethos from Aristotle is the idea of it's twofold. So ethos is both one's presentation of an ethical identity, and it is also one's apparent reliability. So to appeal to ethos is to, you should believe in me because I'm a good person, right? This is the ultimate political move, right? I'm coming to you today as a good, honest American talking to other good, honest Americans about this, right? And so why am I inclined to believe you? Well, he said he's a good, honest American. I'm a good, honest American. We have something in common. So this idea of how we create an ethos for ourselves online, this is the question of, um, I, I guess I could ask this as well. How many of you find that you try to avoid conflict online? You're like, I could poke at that, but it's not worth it. That's not going to go anywhere productive. All right, great, cool, believe that. Or how many of you are like, no, I am going to be the truth fixer. If you're out there saying crazy stuff on Facebook, guess what? I'm showing up in your comment feed and I'm going to show you that what you're saying is crazy. How many of you sort of take stance one of like, look, fighting online never leads anywhere useful. Like this is just going to get into an annoying process of he said, she said, I'm walking away. You do you. So Kathy, you're raising your hand. You're like, that's, that's me. David, yeah. how many yeah. of you, especially, what does, especially if it's relatives. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Because then, then you're like, I'm going to have to see you at Thanksgiving. Right. I can't, I mean, that's, it's sort of like the no politics zone, right? Okay. Don't bring up or, my family being obsessed with sports. Uh, it's like, don't bring up the Houston Astros at the dinner table. It's not going to go well. Um, you know, but this, this idea of, okay, that's not worth stirring. The interesting question is what is the threshold at which you're like, no, I have to get involved in that. And what this is actually leading to is there's a really interesting question. It's a study that's kind of been ongoing is at what point is politeness actually becoming dangerous? because there are all of these views that are being unchallenged because people are like, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not, I mean, that's going to make Thanksgiving really weird. 
if I, if I don't, and, or like, I work with you, this is really weird. And that actually gets back to this question of, if I see the battle is unwinnable, I'm not going to pick the battle, right? If, if what I say, isn't going to change your mind anyway, then I'm not going to try to change it. And then, then it becomes, if no one ever tries to change their mind, and all they get is more and more affirmation of the thing that they currently believe because everybody who could change their mind says that's not worth it. At what point would there ever be an intersection with evidence that would suggest otherwise? And, but of course you have the real question of, well, shit, my emotional labor matters. Like I don't have 12 hours on a Tuesday to get into a long extended debate about the nature of facts, right? I got stuff to do. And so this question of to what extent do you try to pick a battle or consider a battle worth having, um, the fact is that more and more of us are opting out. Or you do the even quieter thing, which is, you know what, I'm just going to defriend you. It's really not worth having you around. It's like, you know, honestly, I want to log on to Facebook or I want to log on to whatever. I want. This is my students. They're like, I just put all of my relatives on a silence list so I don't see any of their stuff. And then I just look at cat pictures all day because that's what I come to social media for is I want to see cat pictures and I want to see somebody doing a funny dance. I am not here to hear what my uncle thinks about Benghazi, you know, six years later. I'm, I'm done with it. I just want to see cat pictures. That question of this leads to a term that probably many of you have heard of the idea of an echo chamber. Um, the idea of at a certain point, I do not want to encounter or engage with beliefs that I see as either harmful to myself or are annoying to myself. Um, how many of you fairly regularly cultivate your online groups? You're like, I no, I, I really just have a few people that I like what they say. And I listen to that and I've actually either hidden or defriended the people that I don't want to hear from. Or how many of you are like, nope, the whole gang's here. I got the people I agree with, the people I don't agree with. I've got everything in between and I scroll through and I see everything they got to say. Would most people say that you you embrace the totality or, or, or more of you like I did for a while and then now I'm living in my own cat and flower zone myself? Yeah, that's... I'm sort of a moderate in that area. Okay. Um, I have two very dear friends and two very dear relatives who are conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, the one that especially shocked me was my dear friend of 45 years who had moved to Panama and then moved back to the, she was from Connecticut. She'd moved to Panama mm -hmm. and then had moved back to Tennessee. And we have um, a sister-in-law in Tennessee who's very conservative. And uh -huh. she almost sheepishly on the phone told me who she was voting for, who was someone <clears throat> very conservative. And uh -huh. um, I thought about it and I thought, I'm not sacrificing this friendship because of politics. And I, I emailed her back saying that, or sure, sure. messaged her back saying that. And um, I, I understand she and her husband have always had their own business. They've never worked for anyone. And she thought this individual who shall not be named was good for business. Sure. So um, I stopped posting political posts and sharing them about three years ago because I became aware that not everyone thought the way that I thought in liberal New England. And right. I agree with a lot of things that my friends say, and I'll, I'll click a like. But sure. Sure. the only political thing I remember sharing was when um, he, should, who, he who shall not be named went to England and there was a cartoon of um, actually a photograph of the queen peering around a door saying, is he gone yet? And that was just so funny. <laughs> well, I couldn't resist poking, <laughs> posting it. What's it? What's an interesting thing about that though, Kathy, right, is the idea of there is, there is a certain point at which there is this calculated question that actually leads to the slide that I have up here, which is your assumed audiences, which is that the people who believe like I do know that I 
believe that way. And then the people who don't believe like I do, well, there's really no reason to antagonize them or to create an atmosphere where this is going to be a problem. So I'm just going to kind of remove my own voice from the discourse and I'll pop in with an affirmation of somebody else's beliefs, but I'm not gonna make myself the center of the conversation, right? That feeling of like, if you know me, you know what I believe, Otherwise, I'm going to post like cool pictures of my grandkids and stuff. And that's right. That's that's sort of like, all right, here's the here's the realm that I'm going to inhabit. There's this really interesting ongoing question of how and when people are choosing to remove themselves from the discourse. And what's interesting is that it is more often it is based on region and it's based on politics. It is unsurprising me being a Texan. Um, quote unquote polite Southerners remove themselves from the discourse because they don't want it to be about politics, but they're removing it because they don't want to be judged for their conservative views. It sounds actually kind of like your friend sheepishly saying I voted for Trump, right? This is this is my relatives back home who will greet you with a hug and a handshake and a darling and a y'all. And they will be like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, I do think we should kick all the illegals out. And you go, well, wait, what and and they're like well you know i just don't talk about it because that really just seems to stir people up right and i and they like and they're like they are good polite honest people to me and that's always the hardship right which is that like okay you have been my friend and colleague and family member for forever and yet i see you post like for example i have you know i work with trans kids and I see what's happening back in my home state and I'm talking to family members and they're like, well, but that's just weird. And, and that becomes the hard thing for me, which is that, all right, to what extent does your behavior towards me intersect with like, how, how do I have a productive conversation with you about this? Right. A thing that I believe and I care deeply about. And yet I also have to care about you as an individual because I like you and you've been in my life for 35 years, you know, how do we talk? And I think, I, honestly, I imagine many of you here probably have at least one relationship in your life where you're sort of sitting there going like, I don't know how to make this work anymore. I, I don't know how to have that conversation or that engagement, or you just don't. You're like, the only way to make this work is to not talk about it. And that is a really difficult space politically, uh, knowledge-wise. It's, it's, it's a variety of things. And this leads to, um, these are three fancy terms. Uh, so Jacob Babb is a social media analyst. And he says, we engage in three types of discourse. And this is also borrowed from Aristotle. There's forensic discourse. If you wondered where the field of forensics comes from, it's actually from the Greek root, which means to look behind. Um, so what does a forensic pathologist do? They look backwards at a crime scene and figure out what happened. So forensic discourse looks backwards and says, why did that happen? Or what can we learn from that? Deliberative discourse looks forward. It says, all right, we're looking ahead. We're seeing what could happen. And here's what we should do as a result of that. What Bab says that social media exists in predominantly is what is called epidiectic discourse, which is this is what's happening right now and it is good or bad. And the purpose of epidiectic discourse is not to change things, but it's, let, it's to let other people know what you think about the thing that is happening. Because if you were going to change it, you would engage in deliberative discourse. This is happening and we should do this or you would engage in forensic discourse, which is, this is happening and how did we get here? Epidiaptic discourse says, this is happening and I think it's wrong. How many of you would say that you've got somebody in your life socially or digitally or otherwise that their predominant role is not to say, here's how to make things better or here's how we got here, but just simply to say, we're here and it's good or bad. Now that's a that's a tricky question. The 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 thing that Bab comes to, he's like social media encourages us to engage in epidiapic discourse because it's a great way of showing your identity. This was announced today. That's terrible. Not that's terrible and like that's terrible and we should do this or that's terrible and here's how we got here. All you say is that's terrible. And other people go, "I know. That is terrible." 
Someone else, shaking my head. Someone else, yeah, it's a shame. Someone else, yeah, I wish it wasn't happening. And that doesn't change anything, but it lets other people know that you think that it's bad. Or it's good. Hey, this happened today. Yay, I know, smiley face. I know, that's great. I know, and that doesn't generate anything outside of the fact that you are showing to somebody else that it's good or bad. This is a really fascinating phenomenon because what it does is it doesn't produce discourse, it simply produces agreement. No one talks about it unless somebody else comes along and says, no, the good thing is bad or the bad thing is good. And then you go, oh, you idiot, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then we haven't moved any further. And so Bab really focuses in on the phenomenon of epidiactic discourse to say, why is it that we're stuck in this loop? Why is it that we aren't looking forward or backward, but instead we're just stuck in, yeah, this is happening and it sucks. And you go, uh-huh, I too also think it sucks. And that's, you are my friend because you also think it sucks. And that's it, like, those don't create thoughtful, engaging, critical thinking bonds, but it does create solidarity. I know that you're with me because I said this thing the other day and you agreed with me. And therefore we are now friends or we are colleagues or we are comrades. Bab says we need to move past this. How can we do this? Well, there's sort of two things that he suggests. We either, we sort of live between two states, according to Bab. We either write with intention or we read with empathy. So what he says is that it, what we should do when we engage in a digital situation is write with intention, which is that, all right, I need to be careful about how this is written. I need to be careful of how it will be received. And I would need to be careful of what the purpose is. And to write with intention means that you hope that it will be read with empathy, which is that you attempt to understand the other side, you provide forgiveness when it's appropriate. I guess what I would say is, which do you find is happening least? People writing with intention, which is to say carefully thinking about what they're going to say, presenting it in a way that is thoughtful, that is developed, or would you say what's happening less is actually people reading with empathy? Which is to say, all right, maybe I do or don't disagree with you, but I'm trying to understand you. I'm trying to engage with you. I'm trying to listen to you. And if you did make a mistake in the past, I'm potentially willing to forgive that in order to move forward. Would you say that they're both equally absent? Would you say is one more present than another? These are sort of Bab's ideals, is a world where we write with intention and we read with empathy. Do you feel I that both? Oh, go ahead. I would say, unfortunately, that not, neither one of those are happening with any. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, any frequency? Major, major impact, yeah. I, I would agree with that. Where, where do you, I mean, is, is there a particular incident or phenomenon that you would be like, this showed like a, an intense gap in reading with empathy? Like, and this is obviously, this is where kind of the rhetoric of cancel culture comes in, right? To read with empathy is to sort of, to give the other person the benefit of the doubt, rather than sort of being like, you have made a mistake and therefore here come the pitchforks. Um, but that feeling of, and, and obviously there's a long extensive debate to be like, is that even a thing? What is... But there's obviously this very real desire to reading with empathy can at times be more complicated because it asks of you to trust in the other person's better nature. And if we've just come up from a slide at the beginning of this presentation saying that only now 30% of us think that people are worth trusting, like if that is the predominant worldview, which is I can't necessarily believe in people and yet Bab is like, the only way for us to get anywhere is to read in an empathetic way that trusts that this person is trying to say something that's worth listening to, even if I disagree with it. That becomes really hard, which is, and, and Kathy, I think that kind of gets to your point of like, well, honestly, since it's hard to write with intention, it's also hard to read with empathy. I'm just going to take a step back from the whole thing and not really poke it either. Like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and let's hope that discourse flows around me in a certain way. Um, 
And so to kind of continue on with that, uh, this is from Steve, this is Steve Bashimi on 30 rock, uh, trying to blend in, uh, at a high school. Uh, how do you do fellow kids, um, wearing his music band t-shirt, this idea of authenticity. Um, if there is one thing that my students constantly talk about as what matters to them, it's that people online are quote unquote authentic. And when I ask them what they mean by that, they say, oh, you know, where they're just, they're being their true self. And I say, well, what is your true self? And they're like, uh, you know, it's just how you would be when you're around anybody else. And I say, the moment that someone puts a camera on you and asks you to look at it, are you yourself? And they're like, well, no, not really. I mean, I, I guess kind of, sort of, but I mean, who's taking the picture? And that's immediately where we start talking about this idea of they're deeply invested in social media figures. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the concept of the influencer. Um, this idea of people who are on Instagram or TikTok that sort of selling products or selling a lifestyle. And a lot of my students very fiercely defend them. And they're like, oh, I love her. She's so authentic. And I was like, she just spent 15 minutes of that video trying to sell you a brand of hair care. And they're like, well, yeah, but she seems like she really loves that hair care. And I'm like, but do you, I mean, she's trying to sell it to you. They're like, yeah, but she would have tried to sell it to me anyway. She's just smart enough to get paid for it. And this is the really fascinating thing that's happening right now, which is that what does authenticity mean? In fact, many of my students were like, well, she was up front at the beginning of the video and said that this ad was, this video was paid for by Noxzema. So yeah, she spends the next 20 minutes trying to sell me an oxima, but I believe it because her skin really does look great. And so she's being authentic. That feeling of you're like, well, no, it's an advertisement. Of course, she's going to tell you that she loves Noxzema because Noxzema is paying her for it. And yet they're like, yeah, but she seems like someone I'd want to hang out with. And that's the real twist of authenticity. Now, I can, in the same class, ask my students, how many different social media accounts do you have? And they're like, oh, 12. And I'm like, are you the same person on each of them? They're like, oh, God, no. Um, I imagine many of you have grandchildren who have a Facebook account. They are aware that you are looking at them. They're like, this is my Facebook self that grandma or granddad sees. This is my Instagram account that my friends see. And ne'er the two shall meet, right? Or my parents or... Um, there is a phenomenon, you have your Instagram and you have your Finstagram. So your Instagram is the one that you let everybody see and your Finstagram is the one that you let your friends see. So this is also like their awareness of employers. They're like, oh yeah, everyone can come see the one where I'm in a button down shirt and smiling. Um, and here I am at the library reading books. And then here's the one with me, you know, with my friends with the red solo cups, you know, bombing it on the beach, right? because they understand that there are multiple selves that they move between. But when you ask them, what do you look for in another person online? They're like being real, being sincere. And it's like, but you just admitted that you create so many different versions of yourself. They're like, well, yeah, but that's true to them. And if you, if you think about if you, how many of you, I guess I might ask, how many of you who are present have more than one social media account? You're on Facebook, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, you're on, or do you have, okay, Kathy, you have more than one. Are you the same person on all of them? Um, well, I use Facebook constantly. Uh, right. Instagram, I use sparingly and have, have fewer contacts on Instagram, but I do check it you know, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, mostly I'm communicating on Instagram with um, my children and their friends who are in right. their 40s. Um, right. Right. And I've heard that people, younger people, have just given up on Facebook. I mean, I, I'm a Facebook oh God. person. I check it every day. They, they uh, with, yeah, my 18 to 21 year olds that I teach, they go, I go onto Facebook for two things, birthdays and anniversaries. They're like, that is, that is when I will engage with that platform is that I know some of my family members or for Facebook messenger. They're like, I use that to stay in touch with people, but otherwise they, they see it as this artifact of an ancient era. They're like Facebook. Yeah. That's where, that's where you, I mean, and that was one of the first generational gaps that I really noticed with my students was they're like, what do you mean 
like Facebook is where people get influenced. No, 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 no. That's on Twitter. And then the next group was, no, it's on Snapchat. And then the current group, it's no, it's on TikTok. And so this feeling of where and how things happen, um, it's, it's a really tricky question. And one of the things that I'm noticing with my students is they have a pitch black sense of humor. It is, it is like the, the kids who are growing up right now, they're like, we have grown up through two like recessions that are supposed to be once in a lifetime recessions, 2008 and, you know, sort of the, sort of the recent developments surrounding, they're like, we have been through a pandemic. We have been through all these different things. Um, and so does anybody here know the little cartoon of the dog that's sitting in a cafe and it's on fire and the dog is drinking coffee and says, this is fine. Um, that's their attitude. They're like, what could I do, but not like laugh. And so this feeling of authenticity, if you have tried to, if you've tried to like engage with social media humor from a younger generation, you're like, this is all just random non sequiturs. They're like, yeah, that's the world is just a bunch of random craziness. And what are you going to do, but laugh at it? That's authenticity. Right, which is the idea of they they have the level of healthy detachment that I have tried to cultivate. I'm not saying that as a as a as an overarching generality. Many of my students are painfully passionate about various things in their lives, but when it comes from what do you think about the future, they go, "Man, what have you thought?" My like when I was 15, 16, 17, you know, it's like, "Oh, I'm about to go to college." I have students who are graduating right now that haven't seen their friends in two years. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm totally hyped about the future. You know, it's it, there. There is a level of cynicism that spreads quickly on social media because we are at this sort of point. Now I'll, I'll jump ahead here. There is this feeling of I have to show myself as being capable of soldiering on because I am being monitored. Um, I ask my female students in particular. If a friend of yours posts something and you don't like it within 30 minutes to an hour, how will that friend respond? And they're like, poorly. Because that's the sign that I am aware and, and constantly engaging with you. Um, so that feeling of this idea, what we have here is imagined and real surveillance is what I'm talking about. Um, this is a quote from a third grader. You don't want to post something bad because if you want a job, those people are going to look at your social media page and they're going to decide if they'll let you have the job. So this is a kid who's nine or 10, even at the age of 10 is already aware of, I need to be cultivating my social media presence for the future because that's how you get a good job. And this comes from a class that was literally an Amazon sponsored math class. Like if, if you're sort of sitting there wondering what the future of education is going to be like in 20 years, you're going to have Amazon prime geography. That is, that is closer to the truth than you would potentially want. Um, funding is shrinking. Corporations are realizing that it looks good to support schools. That's why you're seeing a lot of these sponsored uses of iPads of different sort of objects. You will have, you will have math brought to you by Apple. You will have geography brought to you today by, there will be sponsored content in schools more and more regularly, as well as this awareness of, I am a product. That is really how the next generation of people see themselves is I am a monitored, constantly branded product that is being sold to. And when it comes time for me to get a job, I will sell myself. Um, does anybody in here use LinkedIn? LinkedIn is turning yourself into seven buzzwords and praying that an employer sees those as interesting. That is the rhetoric that these kids are being taught from a young age, which is don't make a fool of yourself on the internet and figure out how to make yourself interesting in a pool of 6,000 applicants. You'd be cynical too. <laughs> there is this awareness of if a third grader is sitting here going, I should really be conscious of my social media presence. That's where we're at. And this idea of, it's also that you'd never stop existing online. Um, there's a, this is a phenomenon known as sharenting, 
Um, how many of you have a child or a grandchild that you have known their entire life, at least digitally? Like you saw their sonogram on Facebook or Instagram, then at one, then at two, then at three, then at five. This is a fairly new phenomenon of kids who are quote unquote born digital and they didn't consent to it. Um, imagine if all of your baby pictures that you can remember as a kid were shared with 3000 people your entire life. There is no privacy, right? There is no awareness of, oh, this is for my family. It's like, this is for my family and, right? Um, and so there was this story, this 11 year old girl was like, hey mom, I'm really uncomfortable with the fact that me running around naked in the mud until I'm four is still on your Facebook page and I'm 12. Um, can we take those down? Like my childhood is mine. Can we not share it with all those other people? And the mom's like, well, no, they've all already seen it. You know, like it's that awareness of like, when is your life yours? And the trick of that is, is if you are born into a world in which you have had a social media presence before you could even talk, which is the trick for a lot of kids is that they've been tagged and spread and shared before they've even had the ability to articulate language. And it's like, welcome. We already have all these pictures waiting for you. That's kind of the messiness of one's digital identity that we're in now. Um, and this leads me to my final concept for today. It's what's called the, the surveillance economy. So uh, Jojana Zuboff, she's a, a, a political theorist, and she says, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, it is not you that is worth something anymore. It is all of the things that you click on and are interested in and share. What makes you worthwhile to a corporation is not just what you buy, it's what data you generate. So Facebook is willing to give you free access to the internet because you are an incredibly useful data point. Um, if you ever want sort of a dark afternoon, go to Facebook analytics. It is their publicly available analytics website that basically talks about all the things that you and your peer group have shared over the last month and how advertisers can pivot to that to be more exciting and synergistic. So they're like, we noticed that people between the ages of 55 and 64 are really into metal guitars this month. You should get on that. And so you now are just an aggregate of data producing interesting trends. And that's what Zuboff talks about is she's like, the more and more that we grant access to these companies, it's not necessarily that they're doing anything insidious with the data. It's that they see it as just pub like if I, if I tell my students, like, do you know Instagram is reporting on you? They go, well, of course. Like, they're not shocked by that. They're not like, oh, oh my God, they're sharing my data. They're like, well, yeah, why else do you think I get Converse ads? You know, they're, they're just like, they, the concept of privacy is one that's thrown out the window. It's like, well, yeah, I'm obviously going to have to give up all of my, how many of you have ever fully read the terms of agreement when you signed up for a new social media service? Cause it's like 25 pages, right? Somewhere within that is you admitting, by the way, I'm not a private individual anymore. There you go. Well, yeah. Okay. And that is, I think that's where I kind of want to end is that this idea of truth and truth making, I think for our, for the students that I teach and the people who are growing up in this world is that if I think of myself first and foremost as a data set that is being appealed to by corporations that are primarily interested in me because of what I provide them in terms of their future data analytics, yeah, I'm not going to trust most of things. I am going to, there is a dissociation with a world that they see as manipulating them from the start. And so what I see are two problems right now. There is the I will believe anything that is told to me because it is necessary for me to believe it. And what I see is actually the even darker possibility is I don't believe in anything because it doesn't matter anyway. What could I do to influence it? I have no power. I gave it all up. I didn't even choose whether or not I wanted to have an identity and my parents and the people around me created it for me. And now I have it. And you know, I am just an object that will be discarded or thrown around by a political system that doesn't really notice or acknowledge me. 
hey, at least there's TikTok. That's the sort of, that's the darker cynicism of the kind of current cultural moment. And I think that is going to be the really crucial thing for education and otherwise to address over the next few years. That's me. That's what it is. 236. That's me. But, uh, are, are there questions, yeah. concerns, anything that I can? Yeah, I have the follow up to what you just said is what is the promise of a kind of a return to truth as, you know, as we used to know it? I think I, what what the the promise of it would be I think what I think what troubles my students and in, in the sense of like okay what's the future of this is that they are seeing it is a world that is predominantly captured moment by moment right they're coming off the George Floyd case in which like this happened on camera they are seeing all of these things that they believe to have proof and truth and identity and I think like, if you want one event that is causing my students to go insane right now, and it sounded like for a number of you, it, it's January 6th. Oh, yeah. They're like, we saw it. We saw it happen. It occurred. Mm -hmm. We watched it in real time. We saw all of these things happen. And now it's June, and we still have people saying, did that really happen? I don't know. What did you see? And I think <laughs> my, you know, and my students are like, what the hell? These are supposed to be the people who are teaching us truth, right? This is supposed to be the older generations that safeguard knowledge and awareness. And we're seeing people on TV being like, well, you know, honestly, if you were just to exchange the footage from January 6th with a bunch of tourists, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what do I do with that? Right. And so I Not think just students that are saying that. <laughs> right. But I mean, it's, it, it, and, but that feeling of, that's where the cynicism comes from. They're like, I am trying to fight with these people to say, this isn't even a political question. This is, do you literally see those people punching cops? And they're like, well, you know, you can't trust. Those could have been hidden secret Antifa people who also bought Trump flags and also have been Trump supporters for seven years and da, 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 da. Like, that's where you get into the truth loophole right which is in order for this fact that i need to be true to remain true which is antifa did it right i have to create an entire sub narrative that makes no sense whatsoever to uphold the primary truth that needs to be true right which is at once what you've seen with covid right covid is an absolute total media hoax that is also a secret bioweapon created by the chinese to kill us all so it mm -hmm. is both harmless and it is also the most dangerous thing in the world created by super scientists. Mm -hmm. And you say, which of those is true? And they go both at once because both <laughs> have to be true. And that is, that is the inherent problem, which is that I need this primary fact to be true, which is this wasn't important. Like January 6th needs to not be important in order for the world to make sense. Well, what are all of the loopholes that I have to jump through in order to maintain that primary truth? Turns out there's a lot, but that hasn't meant that people have been unwilling to jump through those hoops. I mean, ask Liz Cheney, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, th <laughs> this, this idea of perhaps the most conservative leaning uh, she's dick cheney's toy <laughs> and they're like you know what we really just can't trust you with the fate of the republican party anymore right and it's this feeling of like how you know and and so yeah david your, your point of like what brings truth back i don't know i i mean i think that's i think that's what they're clinging to right which is I don't know. This seemed about as provable as a thing could get, and we're here. And so, you know, I, I political action. I don't know consequences. Things that <laughs> I maybe that would bring truth back. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, That's I an think incredibly dark time. note to end on. I don't mean to to sort of lead, but I think January sixth. Mm -hmm. I I can tell you the tone among my students and among the conversations that's happened over this semester everything loops back to that which is if we can't do anything about this what can we do
Yeah. And I, I, I honestly think that will be a center point in a lot of students' political awareness for a long time to come. I really do. Uh, Jordan, this is Charlie. I have a question. Um, do sure. the students feel that they're that they can't change the future? Are, are they just at, uh, resigned to it? I think what they what they are interested in engaging. I think it's it's twofold. I think they would they want to change the future if they felt that their own futures were secure, and that's where it gets really tricky is that I think a lot of them are looking at kind of the gig economy. Uh, I think a lot of them are looking at there, there's, there's this idea of, I would fix the world if I knew that there was a secure job market waiting for me. Um, or I, what I think, I mean, honestly, it, you have, it, I think what's happening is there's a deeper bifurcation. There are the students that are very, very committed, and then there are the students who are not committed at all. And the middle ground is actually kind of the more complicated thing. I have my hyper-passionate students, and then I have my students who have checked out, and then somewhere in the middle are those that are still figuring it out. And, and of course, what the problem is, is that for the hyper-committed students, anything that disrupts that worldview, as I was talking about earlier, is really hard to grapple with. And so I, I don't think it's that they're all resigned to their fate, but they do see something like, um, let me give an example here. Um, at Eastern, we have a lot of dreamers, right? They're the DACA students. And the absolute roller coaster that they went through through the Trump administration, if you want to see people go from optimistic to resigned to broken to optimistic to resigned to like, and that wasn't done until Georgia because that was still a, that was still a question of, all right, the president can do whatever, but if the Senate doesn't want it, then what's going to happen? I mean, those students were like, I don't know what feeling to have right now. Um, and when I talk to my, you know, when I talk to my family, my parents, my dad's like, you guys are going through like a 12 year Vietnam in the sense of like an extended cynicism of like, all right, I don't know if I can trust the government. Okay. I don't know if the leaders in power are good people. I don't know if, you know, and you know, for my dad, he was like, for my, and, and again, I'm speaking my you know, my father is 70. I'm not trying to speak. He was like, generationally for me, the thing that reset the button was Reagan. That, that was my father's belief. He was like, it was morning in America, things reset, things felt hopeful and happy again. And I invested in that. And that's what he was coming off of sort of the seventies and his beliefs during that time period. I don't know what our students hypothetically will see as the reset button. It's not Biden. I can actually tell you that it's, it's not. Um, because they continue to see mm -hmm. things right now as still an ongoing status quo where things aren't really changing that much. Um, and as to whether or not that will, I, he, if, if he, who will not be named, so to speak, runs again in 24 and wins, you're going to see the most fascinating question of what a youth generation does with that potentially ever, um, because that will be the ultimate proof to a lot of them that what does it matter? Like we saw everything happen. We had all of this occur and here we are still like, that's the moment I dread. If there's anything that really scares me about the uh, optimism or hope of a generation, it would be a Trump win in 24. It really does. And that's just me being honest. On the other oh. hand, it could be a massive catalyst. It could be like, apologize for my language here, but fuck it. If the system's broken, let's go. Um, I don't know. I don't know the response that would happen, whether it would be resignation or whether it would be intense resistance. Very. <laughs> I, I, I think Here's the thing is that I think also these students are like, we have been through all this stuff that was destroyed, supposed to destroy us and we're still here. 
Um, you know, they're like, we just, I mean, they're, they're starting to feel that they're on the other side of a pandemic and they're like, that didn't kill us. You know, um, we're here, we're around, you know, I think they're trying to figure out the ways to exist in a world that has been strange and unknowable, um, in a lot of ways. And, you know, the methods, the, the problem is, is that they're retreating more and more into a technology that welcomes them. If you want escapism, that's it, right? That is the ultimate means of siphoning yourself off from reality for as long as you need to. But the problem is, is that their, their mental health and their self image is brutal because what do you see on this every single day, but people making themselves look as good as possible because they don't want to appear like they're missing out. Um, there's a reason that Instagram has literally an entire department of quote unquote mental health activism, because Instagram is the platform that's supposed to make you look good and nothing destroys self-esteem than getting onto account and seeing everybody else in your life, having fun or appearing to have fun and going, why aren't I having that life? And that's what catches them is that they go onto the platform to escape. And then what they run into is other people appearing to be happier than they are. And yet, if you were to talk to those people, they're like, Oh, I'm just as sad. I just know that sad doesn't look good on Instagram. Um, and that's a real, that's a problem. That's a loop. No, it's interesting, Jordan, that, uh, before you mentioned, uh, I think, uh, maybe your dad's comment about uh, the 12 year Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam was in actuality a 12 year Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea that somehow, well, Vietnam was, and this is all magnified now, yes and no. Uh, right. So people who lived uh, through the Vietnam era were beside themselves in many different ways to try to figure out what to do about that. And some people threw themselves into it, patriotic reasons, military tradition and family, whatever it might sure. have to be. And others completely went the other way and just tried to, you know, I mean, there's cognitive dissonance going on there. It's said, well, you know, how do I deal with this? And I want to live, right. I want to survive. I don't want to throw my life away on this thing. And then that was followed up by, um, you know, I mean, the whole uh, counter-cultural movement, which is where a lot of all this started. Right. Um, right. So I look back on that and I think about the economic insecurities that I felt in the 70s as, you know, a younger family guy. Um, sure. With inflation and actually not certain as to how things were going to work out. I didn't have social media back then. We didn't have the same kind of environment in which cognitive bias is uh you know and bias confirmation and uh, availability heuristics and all the rest of it are just there all the yeah. time and, and I, I i i suspect that that is what has made the huge difference not that yeah. things are so much worse than they are today because right. they're not but what is different yeah i i think i think that's absolutely right in in the sense of if you imagine like if you imagine watergate being live tweeted yeah, yeah right like if if you if you could i've i sometimes ask students to think about this i'm like imagine a major historical event if it was experienced through social media like you'd have all these different news organizations sort of you know it, the speed and rapidity at which and i think you know feeding off of that there it's also very easy to have your darkest fears confirmed because all you have to do is hop on online and say things are this gets back to the epideptic discourse right if you hop online and say things are bad you can have a bunch of people appear out of nowhere and say, yeah, not only are they bad, they're even worse, right? And so you're right, it's confirmation bias. It's, well, of course things are bad and all of my friends are telling me I'm bad, so it's horrible. Um, the, it spirals. And I think the other problem, I mean, actually to get back, I think, David, you were the one mentioning about newspapers, right? Like this sounds very simple, but students in a streaming landscape don't own things. Like there's even that feeling of like how you develop a sense of self, right? Like I was still buying CDs, right? I bought movies. I had sort of physical objects and artifacts that sort of cultivated a sense of self and they were mine and I carry them with them. I'm an English professor. So my house is filled with books 
and my students now, you know, it's not, I mean, in a Netflix world, you don't own a movie, right? You rent the rights to it until you stop paying for it. Spotify, you don't have a favorite album. You have a thing that you stream until you move on to the next one. There's an ephemerality to mm -hmm. so much of our identities in a streaming landscape. And that even gets back to home ownership, right? It's it's mm -hmm. not like you you rent an identity, right? You rent your music tastes, you rent your movies, you rent forever, right? You don't even settle on a home because I mean, and certainly I'm sure all of you are seeing the housing market right now. Um, in terms of what it means to buy a house in 2021, it ain't easy. Um, you know, there is that feeling of even having a coherent place to land back in and sort of be like, well, these are mine. They're not really. I mean, there's a really interesting feeling of what a whole generation brought up on the fact of it's mine until it's not, right? Like, like well, I have access to all of that until I stop paying for it rather than I bought it, I hold on to it, I possess it, and I sort of build an identity around it. E even that, I think even just the shift from physical to digital artifacts is doing a lot that I don't think people have fully come to terms with yet. Hey, uh, Jordan, this is Charlie again. Yeah. Do you think, um, you know, we're obviously centering around the, the fact of online life. Mm -hmm. uh, can two questions, one, can the algorithms of online be changed to be beneficial as opposed to destructive? Mm -hmm. uh, and second, um, can can we uh, create a digital online life that is that is uh, positive as opposed to negative? Don't change the algorithms. Yes, yeah. the trick is is that you're going to have to find a corporation benevolent enough to do that. Um, <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the, I mean, that's admittedly the real problem is that you would have to convince Google, hey, Google, rather than producing content that ultimately is profitable to your institution, you should create an equitable, fair, balanced structure that allows for information to flow. The, my, my ultimate example of this is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is perhaps the single greatest knowledge project in the history of humanity, right? It is, un, it is an astonishing accomplishment. And it is done so by the fact that they have to plead for every single cent that they get, right? If you use Wikipedia for any extended period of time, in order for that knowledge to be quote unquote free, somebody has to pay for it. And so I think what would have to happen is you would have to have almost essentially, for one, you'd have to have a nonprofit Google, which I mean, <laughs> don't know if that's gonna happen. Um, or you would have to, what you're getting at is really, I think, a question of human nature, which is that if you give all of humanity a endorphin response machine, right? Um, there's a really fascinating concept called phantom ring, which is that if you don't have your phone on you, but you leave it for a couple of days, your body will still create the sensation of it ringing because you're so used to it. Right. And, and, and there's an actual endorphin cycle that getting likes it's, it's, it's the monkey hitting the tree. Right. Um, to me, the single best way to actually create a healthy online space would be to remove any and all structures of likes, dislikes, point systems, gamified structures, right? Nothing is more toxic to somebody than posting hateful racist comments and getting 3000 likes. Because not only is it a bad thing, you get a feedback loop. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, throw out racial slur here. And then you get all of this immediate feedback of somebody saying, ha ha, great, right? I mean, that was nasty enough when it was having in physical spaces, right? But there was at least the question of blowback. If you're doing that anonymously in a digital landscape where a bunch of other anonymous people are like, oh yeah, totally, I hate blacks, right? The, the the consequence loop there is absent. And instead you get just the absolute worst, which is the feedback loop of someone out there responded to it. Um, and so I look at a, I, a site like Reddit, which I think is on one hand kind of amazing because every interest in the world, you can find other people who are into it, but it's based on a points up, points down system, which just means that it's the information that people like that gets noticed. Um, 
And yet people would say, but that's merit. The more that the internet is based on a meritocracy, the more dangerous it gets because it's like, well, the cream rises to the top. Yeah. But if the cream is racist, awful shit, um, that's really bad. And so, it, you know, the, the question is of like, oh, well, people are responding to it. And of course, Charlie, that gets into the really nasty question of censorship, right? Which is what is happening right now with our former president, right? Should he be deplatformed? And people are like, well, uh, yeah, he has a right to speak, except it's for so when it causes cool. bad things. And then, like, we... He has been effectively deplatformed. He has been. And yep. I think that I think that question of you have people saying, is that the right thing to do, right? It, that question of you have Facebook who just punted it down the road five months ago and said, yeah. uh, we actually need to create better, more holistic standards for how we treat public figures because people didn't like what he was saying. Now, basically what the internet did was just take a cat, like, all of this stuff that our laws were built for and say, yeah, but what if, right? Like, oh, free speech is a really interesting concept. What if you could say it to 6 billion people at the same time? Oh, that's new. Um, okay, how do we handle that? Okay, what if, you know, what is commerce, right? What is, I mean, interstate commerce in a digital landscape is something that we're still trying to figure out. Um, stuff like public utilities. I think one thing that would change it too, Charlie, is if the internet is treated as a public utility. Um, the more and more that it would actually be treated as a public good, rather than if it was treated like water or electricity, um, instead it's still treated as a consumer good. What, and in that, in that case, what that means is who decides what is a good, wonderful online world, Xfinity, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, like. I don't know. I don't necessarily trust Xfinity or Comcast or Cox Wireless to uh, uh, bring about a healthy. They're going to be like, I don't know. All of these trash people saying horrible things is doing really good numbers for our bottom line. Um, I would say that the one thing that we don't want is to say, well, this is a big problem and these companies can't figure it out. So and then hand it to the government. government. No, you don't. You know? yeah. And that's and that's unfortunately where I think there's there's every bit a possibility that this will happen that right. people will start saying well exactly. the rest of you can't figure it out nobody's happy so um you know let's let's can we figure out ways to sort of sort of repeal the first amendment which in a way is happening and i think I, I, that is honestly the that is the inevitable breaking point right which yeah. is you know okay we have this problem. We are seeing that speech is doing these things because we have never before been able to spread and access speech at the rate that it is happening. Mm -hmm. What do you do about that? Right? Um, how do you, yeah. And I think the question is if, if, you know, if you say, well, the corporations can or can't handle it. Um, okay. The government gets involved. All right. So in what capacity? Right. Do you have, do you create something like, I mean, we have the, uh, like the FE, what, what is it? Uh, what was it that Ajit Pai was running? Um, like the FEC. FCC. 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 Communications Commission. Right. So you have something like the FCC, which can regulate to some extent, but then it becomes, okay, do you, I, I wonder if it is going to be something that's almost more like the FDA. Right, which is it's sort of like what is sort of quote unquote the good of the public health, right? Do I do you regulate the internet like you would a drug or gambling or anything that creates sort of like I mean I I don't know. I, I <laughs> yeah, I mean what we're staring down is a question of like civil liberties and structures that is unprecedented because I mean, if you were sitting down 260 years ago and saying, what do we need to account for? What about an instantaneous communication platform that can spread across the entire world in nanoseconds? And they're yeah, like, right, yeah. uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? or, uh, or, or, or weapons that can fire more 
more rounds in uh, two minutes oh, yeah. than an entire brigade of musketeers. Exactly. Yeah. Fire yeah. In an hour. yeah. The Second Amendment is a lot different with an AK-47 than a musket. I mean, it's yeah, it's yes, it, exactly. yeah. And and there, I I think what you're getting back to is also kind of a question of, I mean, if you want to jump across to political science, which I'll leave to my more qualified colleagues, but it's, it's sort of originalist doctrine, right? What is the spirit of the document? If it is trying to attest for things that could not have possibly fathomed, right? Like what is the intent of the founders when confronting a technology that would be so beyond their comprehension? Like, how do you sort of speak to the spirit of the document? It's going to require some interpretation. Uh, and yeah. I don't know where that's going to lead. And obviously that gets you to the current question about what the future of the Supreme Court is going to be and how that will be legit. I mean, yeah, it's, it's powder keg on top of powder keg, but, um, you know, and here we are. Well, Jordan, I want to thank you very I'd, much for a very interesting yeah. talk. Um, I wish I could say that you were leaving us on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will say this. Yeah. I mean, after after you know such a dark note. I mean, one of the things that you can immediately do after this is done is go find something absurdly it's inspiring and have it in front of you in two seconds. Right. You know, um, <laughs> if you if you want to go uh, just drink in the positive vibes, that's just right there at your fingertips too. So right. Right. Sure you do that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There's there's that too. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Everyone have a wonderful day, wonderful summer. Yeah, great discussion. Thank you. We're, thank you. we're having you back in the winter. That's a promise. Sounds good. If uh, yeah, if if you'll have me, I'll be there. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Oh,